does Modoc often lose, speaking of that question? What makes him so useless? Mainly, it's all in how he's written, I would say, and honestly in his design. His design probably lends to it as well. I mean, he's just a giant head in like a floating chair. You know what I mean? It's his little limbs. Modoc, though, should be a terrifying and intimidating villain. And in some respects, and some alternate universe stories, he is. But for the most part, he is made a mockery of in the comics, despite the serious threat behind his name. Initially, George Charlton was a man working for AIM who was experimented on and basically altered to become the ultimate tool for analyzing the cosmic cube, which was in their possession. As a result of his enhanced intellect, his head became massive and he was given a chair to aid him as he was no longer mobile on his own. At least, that's one of his origin stories. The chair that he was given was named the Doomsday Chair and George became MODOK, mental organism designed only for computing. MODOK. But AIM failed to predict what other side effects the added knowledge capacity and intellectual power might have on MODOK, who turned on those who had made him and ultimately became MODOK, with a K instead of a C, to be clear. Mental organism designed only for killing. Ah! Despite his kinda epic backstory and the meaning behind his name, I think MODOK is often used as a joke villain in the comics. Which villains do you think deserve more respect? How do you feel about villains being used somewhat as comedic relief? I don't know. Me personally, sometimes I like it. I really liked the MODOK series, I thought it was really funny, but also sometimes it can work against a character too. And especially like take away from their threat level, so. Like MODOK, Riddler is one of the villains who often just isn't that intimidating. I gotta be real with you. I mean, I love him as a villain and I love his gimmick, but there is honestly something about Batman villains. A lot of them have to have gimmicks, it seems. And for many of them, it doesn't add to their capability. In fact, it kind of limits their capability, if I'm being honest. Riddler is one of those. At times, he can feel unstoppable, like some mastermind who is many steps ahead of Batman. Although Batman, even if lagging initially, always seems to catch up since he is known for being, you know, the greatest detective in the world. But if you also just took Riddler and put him in a room with Batman and it came down to like a round of fisticuffs, I know know where I would place my bets personally. I think you know where you'd place yours too. Being physically fit, simply put, isn't for every villain. This next one included. Mastermind is one of those villains you usually never think of when you think of someone that you just like wouldn't want to fight. You'd be like, Mastermind, I guess I'll fight him. It's not that bad. But honestly, he can be pretty dangerous. His mutant powers allow him to alter someone's mind, making them see illusions or even changing their memory in some cases. He was one of the folks responsible for helping to break Jean Grey when she was at the Hellfire Club. And his interference was part of what moved her along on her way to becoming Dark Phoenix. He's also been the person that's kind of been attached to the Void, Sentry's evil persona. That being said, at the end of the day, Mastermind powers are purely mental, which means that he isn't the most physically intimidating of characters. Also, it was established earlier on in his canon that he actually has to remain focused on the illusion that he's conjuring at all times. Like, if he breaks the concentration, then the illusion just disappears. So that's also something to consider, even from a psionic powerhouse standpoint. Oh yeah, and his illusions also, if you, like, try to touch them, like, you can go right through them. So, probably won't touch them because that's how good of illusions they are, but if you do see a wall and you decide to run through it, you'll get through it and then the illusion is broken. So you can still break them. They're breakable. Having a powerful mind is of course great, but it doesn't mean that you'll come out on top. Look, Brainiac 5 is often presented as being allergic to Earth's germs. So while he is a powerhouse when it comes to how much knowledge he has and therefore what he can get done, the fact remains that if he decides to come to Earth to face Superman, which is where admittedly Superman usually is, Brainiac can't even really leave his ship. While not all versions of the character turn him into a physical weakling, more have than haven't ultimately. For the most part, he's a villain whose power is his intellect, not his strength and prowess as a fighter. So while he's still an iconic and dangerous Superman villain, in a one on one fight, in most instances, Superman easily takes it. Even if a villain can see the future, it doesn't always mean they'll be the most useful in a fight either. Like this next villain. Destiny is honestly one of my favorite characters in the comics right now. Her relationship with Mystique, her dismissiveness sometimes, her sassiness, the fact that she was pretty much one of the only people standing in the way of Sinister taking over initially in Sins of Sinister, all of this and more make her an amazing character to read about. But just because I can acknowledge how great her strengths are doesn't mean I can't acknowledge her weaknesses too. Destiny is more of a person who advises on fighting than actually does the fighting herself. She doesn't have super strength or endurance or toughness. In fact, up until recently, she was 
dead for a really long time in the comics, proving just how squishy she is and can be. In a fight that comes to blows, she's not exactly the one you'd want in the middle. Instead, she's often better served, kind of staying off to the side, watching and looking to the future for strategies on how best to win here. Seeing the future is one thing, but how about villains who can see into and even control another's mind? Dr. Psycho gained more prominence thanks to his inclusion in the Harley Quinn animated series. Currently in the comics, he's one of Wonder Woman's main foes. That's just how powerful he is. And in the Harley Quinn animated show, he was also revealed to be pretty powerful and even faced off against Harley Quinn using a helmet to amplify his powers, kind of like how he's done before in the comics. With this helmet, he was able to control Darkseid's parademon army. However, the fact remains that while Dr. Psycho can control other physically powerful beings to make them do his bidding, he actually wouldn't be as good himself alone physically in a fight. Without his helmet, the best he can do is actually control one or two people at most. So against all of the Amazons, let's say, he would be struggling. This next villain has something in common with Dr. Psycho. He also typically gets others to do his bidding. Arcade is pretty messed up when it comes to what he's capable of doing. His main thing is being the guy to make crazy death traps for people to fall into and then later try and escape. And for the most part, he doesn't even really like make those necessarily himself. He like hires other people. He holds people ransom to basically get them to do his bidding for them. He is the creator of the deranged amusement park-like location known as Murder World. He's kind of like Jigsaw saw, but without even like any moral code. However, I'd argue that both are equally deranged when it comes to their outlook on life and how they choose to treat other people. But I mean, at least John thinks he's doing something that can help people, whereas Arcade kind of just does it because he thinks it's a fun way to kill people, which is his job as an assassin for hire, I suppose. Arcade, however, as an individual, is honestly just a guy. A smart and twisted guy, but ultimately, he's just a man. I would even argue that John Kramer has more of a supernatural aura about him than Arcade does. Pretty weird, considering that Arcade comes from a comic book. This next villain is super iconic, which is why I felt a bit bad about including him on my list, to be honest. I'm feeling a little guilty about it, but when you think about it, the fact remains that Lex is, he's just a guy. I mean, he's a super smart, resourceful, and rich rich guy, I know, but still, he's just a man. In fact, while Lex boasts of being super intelligent, he's also made, honestly, some questionable moves in the past. Like, remember when he could have cured cancer and then he just didn't? The fact that Lex Luthor manages to remain as one of Superman's greatest villains is honestly baffling to me. But it's really something only made possible by the fact that Superman is super good and does not believe in killing. Because if he did, Lex wouldn't stand a chance against him. Moving on to another genius. If you know me, if you know what I like, me, Amanda, you will know that this is one of my favorite evil geniuses. Mr. Sinister was recently proven to be one of the most powerful villains around. He was so powerful, in fact, that he ended up managing to control pretty much everything and created his own version of the world in Sins of Sinister. Of course, this timeline would later be corrected and wiped out, but it's still impressive that he even managed to achieve this. But at the end of the day, Mr. Sinister is ultimately just a scientist. This means that when it comes to bronze, he tends to be kind of lacking. Like I know, he's also usually portrayed as being like a really big, kind of deezed guy in some instances, but for the most part, I would say we don't present Mr. Sinister that way, and he doesn't have super strength or anything like that. But you know, he probably takes care of himself. He probably goes to the gym. However, case in point is his fight against his one-time nemesis, Tarn the Uncaring, a mutant of Araco. Now, Tarn is an example of someone who can play with genetics and be deadly in a fight. This is because of his mutant ability to alter the genes of anyone, just like that. Tarn, along with his group known as Locust Vile, were therefore able to make fairly quick work of Sinister and his group of Hellions. Our final point is an interesting one, because I feel like you could also make a case for him on a different list. A list where he would be considered the most powerful and unstoppable of villains. And of course, I'm saying that he is powerful here, just not particularly useful in a fight. Sorry, Joker. Joker is a great foil for Batman, because he embodies pretty much the opposite of what Batman stands for, and yet there's also a ton of parallels between those characters. If Batman is disciplined, control, respect, respect, hard work, and justice, then Joker is disorganized chaos without regard for anyone else or other lives, more prone to throw a plan together haphazardly and messily, and of course a symbol of injustice as the crown prince of crime. It's not to say they don't have parallels, like I said, they're both also highly obsessive people. However, just because he's the opposite of Batman doesn't mean he'd manage to survive in a one-on-one -on -one fight against him. When Joker survives his encounters with Batman, it's really only because Batman allows this to be so. Let's be real. Joker might be unpredictable which makes him a challenging foe for bats, but Batman ultimately has more skills in a single pinky than Joker has pretty much in his entire being. 
I would wager. And at number 10 is Cyber. Adamantium encased arms and body, claws that inject victims with hallucinogens, mutant psychic tracking abilities, and even the ability to cast his consciousness into other bodies. Silas Burr has, or at least had, a truckload of impressive abilities and should be a huge threat, but he just kinda isn't. I'm not really sure why Cyber has been made to just kinda suck, but he really has. He was even responsible for giving Wolverine one of his most severe beatings up until that point in his very long life, and was partially responsible for not only Wolverine's training, but Dawkins as well. But in the gallery of Wolverine rogues, he just doesn't really have anything else to his name. He mainly worked as a lackey to other people, and even though he has all the advantages that he has, he doesn't really become much of an issue for his opponents. He trained Dokken, but that boy takes Cyber down pretty readily. I believe at this point he is on his fourth or fifth body as the new Hornet, and he has transitioned to be a villain for Ben Riley's Scarlet Spider. And nothing against Scarlet Spider, I like that character, but Marvel downgraded him from Wolverine to not Spider-Man. Number nine. Starlet. Starlet is a villain that we get to meet in the series Batman White Knight Presents Harley Quinn, which I gotta say, even now, I'm kind of still reflecting on this on this series. At first I read it, I wasn't, I didn't feel super impressed, but it stuck with me a lot, which I think is a testament to it. The artwork in that series is also really beautiful, and honestly, I think it's worth a read just for that, but the story, a twisted sort of criminal mystery slash drama, is also quite good in this six issue mini. Starlet is the villain of the tale, with her true identity being revealed later on. Harley joins the case to help apprehend Starlet as a consultant. Starlet is targeting old Hollywood stars and killing them in Gotham as part of her plot. I don't want to spoil the ending of this one in case you want to read it, but you have yet to do so, so I will just say this. While Starlet is revealed to have some inside information, which is a big part of what makes the villain so deadly and ruthless, Starlet's weakness lies in their capacity to think logically and overestimate their value. In other words, a classic villain weakness in my opinion, that of ego or hubris, alas. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we're talking about here, and you love basically characters that are kind of off kilter, but have some pros and have some cons, be sure to check out our top 10 weirdest playlist where we talk about a lot of characters that basically are that. Number eight, Stiltman. Oh, Stiltman. No list of useless or less than impressive villains is complete without his inclusion. He is the biggest joke in Marvel's villain community and has been embarrassingly defeated by a large number of heroes, most of whom have much larger fish to fry. But his stilts, top notch feet of engineering. What are some uses we can think of for his stilts? I mean, outside of obviously reaching the top shelf or painting the hard to reach spots in a room, I could see this being incredibly useful for construction work or for firefighters or any kind of emergency service. Outdoors electrical work would be a breeze if you wouldn't need to use one of those big skyjack cranes. Window washing would be a big one. I mean, they could even be used for transportation. You know how much faster you would get from place to place with legs being that long? I think we can agree being able to stand at 290 feet would have a ton of helpful uses, but fighting superheroes is very clearly not one of them. Number seven, KG Beast. KG Beast has to be one of the most embarrassing villains around in the comics, in my opinion. Despite being a supposedly trained and extremely gifted fighter and tracker, half the time or more, it seems like he misses his shots in terms of completing hits tasked to him, and he almost always ends up dead. Like, not a great assassin, I'm just saying. More recently, this once again happened when he threatened the life of Barbara Gordon and came face to face with Nightwing once more in the Nightwing series. Important to note that here, KG Beast was the one to make Dick Grayson forget who he was before, causing him to become Rick Grayson. This was during an attempt on Nightwing's life, following him being shot. So as you can imagine as well, KG Beast was pretty handily defeated here, especially once the Titans sort of came in to assist a bit and Nightwing's friends came in to assist. Just wasn't it wasn't a good time for KG Beast again. Nightwing lived, but for a time would have amnesia and think he was Rick, and it was a weird time, and we all like to pretend it didn't happen, but it did, so we have to acknowledge it. And not only did KG Beast fail this mission, because he was basically tasked with trying to kill Nightwing, but he also ended up left for dead in an arctic tundra of Russia. Batman basically used his grappling gun to paralyze KG Beast, this was during his time hunting him, which caused KG Beast to break his neck. Then after Afterwards, despite Anatoly's begging, Batman refused to help him. He was just like, 
I'm just gonna leave you here. KGB's was like, but wait a minute, don't you have to like help people? And he was like, I think if I just leave you here, it's I didn't kill you, just a thing that happened, you know? So bye. Number six, Johnny Soro. As someone who used to be a silent film actor before turning to a life of crime, it's almost fitting that the powers he eventually attained were all about his physical appearance. While battling the Justice Society of America, Johnny got torn apart as he was teleported to the subtle realms. Here, this incredibly terrifying eldritch being called the King of Tears reformed Soro with this new terrifying form that could literally cause people to pass away as soon as Soro removed his mask. He was intangible with his mask on, could teleport, levitate, and manipulate energy. But he still kind of ended up being a huge disappointment. Unfortunately, his main power didn't always work the way he intended. The wizard Shazam, as an example, was only turned to stone by Johnny Soro. And in the case of Captain Adam, he just exploded and quantum leaped through time, which is kind of just a weird alternative, but comic books got a comic book. His ability also doesn't work on people who are blind. So when Dr. Midnight faced him, nothing happened, and Midnight simply showed Johnny a recorded image of his face, which paralyzed Soro and let the superheroes destroy him. He has come back from this somehow, but he's just never been as threatening as you might assume he could be. Number five, Jan Rog. Jan Rog is just one of the most ridiculous villains out there in my opinion. He is from the Kree race and as such has an enhanced physiology, but beyond that he is supposed to be a menacing military leader who at one point threatened Marvell, Kree champion and also a military leader. Jan Rog was a colonel in the Kree Imperial Army who is extensively trained in both armed and unarmed combat. And the Kree themselves are known for their military prowess and excellence as well as advanced tech. But for some reason, Jan Rog is rarely successful in his plots to defeat either Marvell or later on one of his successors, Carol Danvers. Jan Rog for a brief time was known as Magnetron, being revealed to have survived the Psyche Magnetron explosion and gained his own powers as a result. Because of course Carol also gained her powers from that, but then later we learned she was also part Kree, but anyways, moving along. At one point, Jan Rog tries to call home to the Kree Empire and attempts to make a deal with them, but not even they are willing to take him seriously, having seemingly forgotten who he was after all these years with him likely having been presumed dead after going MIA. Jan Rog call home. <laughs> Holmes says, no, we don't want any of that. <laughs> Bye. Number four, Pace Pot Pete. Peter Petruski developed this incredibly strong glue that could have been the key to a long, prosperous, money-filled life if he had decided to sell it or develop it further, or heck, even be a hero with it. The glue was handy. He could have been someone. But instead, this big old dingus became a criminal. But what's even better is that not only did he rob himself of a bright, non-criminal future, since he decided to call himself Pace Pot Pete, and his main shtick was frickin' glue, he became the laughing stock of all the villains. Except for maybe Stiltman. Sure, Peter did turn things around slightly when he changed his name to Trapster, but like, not really. The damage was done. His glue could be useful in so many different ways, not even just day-to-day -day stuff, like he could have gone into construction or, or art. And I'm sure he could have even found a way to get into weapons manufacturing as he even was able to develop a weapon for firing the glue. But no, this Goomba squandered it all to become the butt end of a joke. It's a shame. Number three, Belasco. I mean, Belasco is supposed to be one of the most menacing guys at Marvel Comics, right? He's basically like a demon lord of hell and a former ruler of Limbo, which you know is a hellish dimension, so I don't mean an actual demon lord of hell, but like Limbo's kind of like hell. And I'll grant you that on paper, he does seem pretty scary. But then there is the fact that he also kidnapped a young mutant so he could mold her into his own weapon, and she, well, I mean, she ended up kicking his butt, so as she rightfully should. Now granted, this young mutant wasn't just anyone, it was magic, and we all know that Elyana is a straight up powerhouse, a force to be reckoned with. But the hilarious part is that Velasco is so egotistical that he thought he could just turn magic into whatever he needed her to be, using her, and in the end, he kind of created his own worst enemy by ever bringing her to Limbo to begin with. So. Yeah. In at number two, Mr. Mixlepidolic. Now, hear me out. I need to make it clear that I am actually a big fan of Mr. Mix. He's really, really cool and just a blast to read. But as a villain, he's not exactly the greatest of them. He doesn't do more than be a pest to Superman and is even a pest to Superman's villains, mainly Lex Luthor. He has benefited Superman way more than he's hindered the guy. He is kind of 
kind of worthless as a villain, I'm sorry. But that doesn't change the fact that he is one of the most powerful guys around, being a reality warping fifth dimensional imp. He's just responsible with his reality warping powers because he knows the damage it could cause. But that essentially means he isn't really a huge threat. We have seen his same powers but in the hands of an actual villain when we got the Emperor Joker storyline. And that pretty much shows us exactly the kind of things Mr. Mix is actually capable of. It's a lot, but he doesn't do any of that. Instead, he just tries to give the Man of Steel a bit of a headache, which he does succeed at doing. Still, being Superman's number one fan makes him kind of a useless villain, but I am open to being corrected in the comments. Number one, Sleaze. Sleaze. Wow. I mean, I think it's hilarious how much evil Sleaze could really be doing as a villain, like on like a huge scale, considering how powerful he is, and yet he chooses to basically just be like a huge creep instead, which you know, is definitely evil in its own way, but it's still on a much smaller scale. That's interesting to me. You might know Sleaze from one of his sleaziest plots. To get back at Darkseid, he planned to force Big Barda and Superman to make a special tape. I can't say it on YouTube, but you know what you know what I mean. He hoped to make enough money to build himself an army, which he could use to then get revenge on Darkseid for banishing him. I don't even really know how that would work because then you'd have American dollars and like, can you use those in space? And or was he gonna make a human army? Because that probably wouldn't be too great against Darkseid. Sleaze himself, however, he's a new god. So even without capturing Big Barda or her Mega Rod, he could probably be operating much more high-level schemes and even possibly threatening the entire Justice League. But because he's mainly just a huge creep. He usually just comes up with the weirdest, grossest plots and fortunately is stopped at almost every corner. Thank goodness. I mean, not every corner, but almost every corner. What a gross character. Sleaze has been shown to possess powers that allow him to alter his size, make others feel emotion, especially deep compulsions of desire. He can also drain energy or powers and can even take control of or at least heavily influence his enemy's mind. So yeah, he should be doing a lot more stuff, but um, he's Sleaze and he was made by John Burns, so he's just kind of a gross Weirdo. And number 10 is I Scream. Now I need to get something off my chest. I Scream here is a mutant with the ability to transform himself into any flavor of ice cream. Literally any flavor, which gives me so many questions. But he has named himself I Scream. Like I as in eyeball and scream. Why? Why not just go with straight up ice cream? Or like I, like the letter, scream. In the comments, give me your ideas for what would be a better ice cream related supervillain name other than eyeball scream. Please, like banana split you in half or something like that, just anything. Either way, ice cream was a villain of the X-Men who appeared one time, when he decided he needed to destroy the X-Men using their danger room. He actually got pretty far in that plan, sneaking into the mansion in his melted ice cream form, and was even able to overload Cerebro, taking down Professor X temporarily, before Xavier came back to and lowered the temperature in the room, freezing ice cream's ice cream form, which is when a clown turned him into a banana split and split from the scene. I'm not even joking. Just go read Obnoxio the Clown from 1983 and you'll see all you need to see. And at number nine is Turner D. Century. Clifford F. Michaels was the son of a chauffeur of a millionaire named Morgan Riley. Now after his father passed on, Clifford was adopted by Riley, who was criminally obsessed with the values of the very early 20th century. And in order to instill those same values into Clifford, he closed off the boy's access to the outside world. Because of this, Clifford despised the social social norms of the modern world when he was finally an adult and exposed to society. This is what made him become a villain, dubbing himself Turner D. Century. He donned a handlebar mustache, a straw boater hat, and a striped green jacket and set himself to attacking any person or anything that represented modern society. So basically everything. After being defeated by Spider-Woman, he escaped prison somehow and developed the Horn of Time, which would allow this unremarkable hero to end the lives of anyone under the age of 65. Absolutely diabolical. But don't worry, the Horn didn't even work and just knocked down anyone under 65 in a very limited range, who, as you can imagine, did have the bodily strength to get themselves back up again, and he was quickly taken down by Spider-Man. And at number eight is the slug. The slug is just super fat. 
I wish I was joking, but like, this dude is obese to the point of immobility. He simply cannot stand up under his own power and needs a high-tech personal hovercraft to just get around. Luckily, he is a Miami-based crime lord, which means he can afford both his little hovercraft and the ungodly amounts of food that he needs to constantly be eating. On the plus side for Ulysses Lugman, his large amounts of fat let him float in water. It makes his vital organs basically impervious to attack and gives him a limited immunity to poison. He is essentially completely useless though against any opponent, which means he relies heavily on his goons, although he does have enough fat that he is infamous for completely suffocating victims between his roles. Unlike a lot of large characters like this, the slug isn't actually a mutant and doesn't technically have any actual superpowers, although it is worth noting that the official handbook of the Marvel Universe claims that Slug technically is a mutant because, and I quote, it is difficult to imagine how a normal person could achieve such tremendous mass and still remain alive. I actually had a blast making this list and if you guys love fun topics like this, make sure you like this video and subscribe here at Top 10 Nerds so I can make more. Thank you. But in at number seven is White Rabbit. For someone so incredibly inept at committing crimes, White Rabbit sure does have a relatively long history in Marvel Comics. In the beginning, sheltered rich girl Lorena Dodson committed her first crime by ending the life of her 87-year-old arranged husband, as she found the trophy wife life boring. She then used her inheritance to buy a bunch of high-tech equipment and, being inspired by Alice in Wonderland, she went off as the villainous White Rabbit. For her first crime, she shall rob a fast food joint. This dastardly crime brought her into confrontation with the most fearsome of heroes, Frogman. And she almost brought him down too if it wasn't for the intervention of Spider-Man, who finished her off with an astounding amount of ease. Spider-Man has actually defeated her on multiple occasions with the same amount of ease, and she's even been defeated by Mary Jane Watson. Now don't even get me started on the amount of animal themed villains she has allied with. In fact, she's allied with a lot of other low level villains, but never to any amount of great success. She does have a giant heavily armed robotic rabbit though, and that part, that part is kinda cool. Number six, critical mass. Okay, so look, we already talked about the slug, and I just wanna say, I think Marvel has something against severely overweight people. The amount of supervillains who are just massive is actually ridiculous. The slug, obviously, but like the blob, the shadow king, Pink Pearl, and the Kingpin, although that's actually all muscle. And then there's Critical Mass, aka Arnie Gunderson. Arnie was one of Peter Parker's classmates back in the fourth grade, but eventually he gained the mutant ability to project explosive forces from his fingertips, which is actually a really cool power. But that didn't save Arnie from being just a massive man for seemingly no reason. Together with some evil mutants, he formed the Band of Baddies, and with a name like that, you know we got some real winners here. The band abducted another explosive mutant named Mary Beck, which brought them into conflict with Wolverine and Spider-Man. Unfortunately for the baddies though, one of their number threatened Mary, who then accidentally unleashed her powers, taking out every single one of the villains. And we never saw Critical Mass ever again. The end. Lasted three issues of Marvel Comics Presents. That's it. Number five, Asbestos Lady and Asbestos Man. Some villains are just a sign of the times, man. Asbestos is incredibly heat and fire resistant, and back in the day, we really used to take advantage of the mineral. It was in thousands of products, and it even came into our comic books with the supervillain known as Asbestos Lady, who was fittingly a villain for the original Human Torch, the android Jin Hammond. Now, Victoria Murdoch created herself a costume made entirely of asbestos, which basically made her immune to fire when she wore it. Since it is no longer back in the day, we now know that asbestos is actually incredibly carcinogenic. Not only does it cause mesothelioma, but it also causes a lung disease called asbestosis. Of course, neither the writers of the comics nor the villain herself actually knew this at the time though, but that didn't save Victoria, as she eventually did pass away at the age of 45 thanks to idiopathic pathic mesothelioma. Kind of surprisingly, Marvel created Asbestos Man, Orson Karloff as well, who had no connection to Asbestos Lady other than also wearing an armored suit of Asbestos. 
and he actually survived his cancer but continued wearing the armor just this time he dragged around an air canister to keep him alive. He was unwilling to fight anyone and everyone was afraid to go near him which led to an hours long standoff with the Great Lake Avengers before eventually just surrendering and then apparently dying at a later date off panel. Probably from the asbestos. Number 4. Life Form Now. Look, life form here is potentially very powerful, and after learning about this villain, I actually kind of hope they bring him back. But George Prefrock's time in comics came and went like a fart in the wind. The son of a fanatical right wing libertarian saw George trained by his father to prepare him for the world. Although he wanted to be an actor, George was convinced by his dad to become a scientist. His dad actually also got George a job at Advanced Idea Mechanics, but I bet his father didn't know that this would in inadvertently get George exposed to the pro-gamma virus. This virus mutated George into this grotesque monster, becoming known as the life form. Now, George has superhuman strength, durability, a healing factor, and he can survive in water and the vacuum of space. But he's a monster. He even caused Frank Castle the Punisher to run away because his weapons had no effect on life form. Now eventually Frank knocked him into a river with a rocket, but George came back. Now with two personalities. One his normal peaceful self, and the other being the monster. George now came into conflict with Daredevil, but this time he was more of a confused monster and eventually in an altercation with police, his heart began beating so fast that he collapsed and then dissolved into a puddle. But when he reformed, he was put into battle against the Hulk by the alien Mercy, who also turned him back into an actual man again, eventually. But this wouldn't last as he remutated and attacked an entire hospital. This led him into conflict with S.H.I.E.L.D., who contacted Mr. Fantastic, who was actually incapacitated, so the Silver Surfer took George to a dead planet, destroyed by Galactus and then just left him there as he couldn't bring himself to put an end to this dual personality monstrosity. And that's the last we ever saw of life form, just out on the remnants of a dead planet, one part of him wanting to end and the other half growing more and more hungry. Why is he useless? Because he is a massive wasted opportunity for a really, really cool character. And at number 3 is the Matador. There have been two people to assume the supervillain name of the Matador, and they were both arguably very useless. But the second Matador, whose real name is known only as Juan, is somehow much more violent and simultaneously much more useless. This Matador isn't even the main villain of the comic he appears in. When Daredevil Matt Murdock is in Monaco on the trail of a lawyer named Alton Lennox and his mob boss client, Tybold Luca, going undercover to a party, Daredevil comes to the main attraction, which is a bullfighting ring. But oh my god, the Matador was actually in love with Tybold's daughter, Lily, and was working with Tombstone. Whoa! He takes out Tybold Luca with his sword, and then eventually Daredevil knocks out both him and and tombstone. But the original Matador, he used his cape to distract and blind people, which he tried to do to Daredevil, who's blind. Number two, Stilt Man. As far as concepts for villains go, Giant Stilts is absolutely one of the worst ones. Have you ever tried to stand on stilts? If you were even successful in doing so, you probably realized just how difficult all other tasks became when you were on those stilts. Now, imagine those stilts were 290 feet high. What's interesting is that if you go to his Marvel Wiki page, Stiltman actually has quite a long history being involved in many different storylines, although I think it's fair to say that a lot of his appearances were just a little bit bit of a joke. But still, his stilts are actually pretty strong. At one point, the strength of them was able to plunge She-Hulk so far into the ground that she ended up in the subway. But on the other hand, she beat him by standing between his massive stilt legs and then just pushing them apart, causing Wilbur to fall all the way down into her arms, where she just promptly carried him like a baby to the authorities. Now don't even get me started on Lady Stiltman. First of all, they couldn't even give her her own supervillain name. Lady Stiltman? Just Stilt Lady. I I don't know man. But secondly, she was defeated by Deadpool when he opened up a manhole cover and one of her legs went straight down. Spider-Man even said that she was trying too hard and he webbed her up to a wall, which is just rude. And finally, in at number one is Paste Pot Pete. This guy rebranded himself and still couldn't save himself. Paste Pot Pete, or Peter Petruski, patented a multi-polymer adhesive that actually led him to become very wealthy. But 
being a complete doofus, instead of actually following that success, Peter decided to instead try and be a supervillain, creating a paste gun and successfully robbing a bank. Now following that, he decided he would next go after stealing a Delta Cosmic Missile from the military. And thanks to the Human Torch, this was a humiliating failure. Surprisingly, having your only weapon and tool as a villain, being a super glue gun, is not the key to success. And he quickly became a joke to the superhero community. He even rebranded himself to the Trapster, like I said, which is a much better name, but a little overshadowed by his time as Paste Pot Pete. Actually, that name causes him to go into a rage and is actually listed as one of his weaknesses on his wiki page. Despite his hilarious past, Trapster has been a recurring villain for years, although he is almost never taken seriously. Number 10, Polka Dot Man. This villain comes to us from DC, another Batman villain gone wrong. And get ready for a lot more Batman villains, cause he's just the beginning of some of the most useless. I'm not sure who would win between Batman and Spider-Man for most useless villains, but both heroes have their own pretty steep pile of terrible ones. Polka Dot Man, whose real name is Abner Krill, is a villain who uses a polka dot suit to cause his mayhem. He has no superpowers of his own, so he relies heavily on this suit. The suit allows Abner to remove the polka dots which can change size and transform into a variety of different weapons. Where the suit came from is unknown. Did he make it? Find it? I'd like to think the latter because while you may be thinking this suit sounds pretty useful, and sure, maybe it does, Abner can't really seem to repair it when it breaks. Apparently the upkeep on it is so expensive that he sometimes just can't afford it. So I assume it is some kind of alien tech that is ultimately just worn by a regular Joe. Which means that he's somewhat useful in a fight, but if his outfit breaks, he is rendered useless. Number 9, The Kangaroo. I love when supervillains are recognized even in the comics as being weak. And that is precisely what happens with Frank Oliver, famed jumper, ashamed boxer, and Spider-Man villain. Frank grew up obsessed by kangaroos cause you know, he's Australian. It feels like Marvel writers were locked up in a room when they came up with this villain and they wouldn't be allowed to leave until they had a new villain for Spider-Man. What if he's Australian? And um, what makes him Australian? I don't know Jim, I'm starving, I just gotta get out of here. Uh, I don't know, kangaroos? That's, that's it, that's brilliant, we've got it! Needless to say, Frank is a former boxer who was fired after he seriously injured a fellow boxer during a match. And his quote unquote power is that he can jump really, really well and, um, you know, higher than normal. Marvel admitted just how weak he was when they decided to give him cybernetic enhancements. The unfortunate thing for Frank is these enhancements just make him just like jump better. Like really? Even these improvements would not stop him from leaping to his doom in the comics. Though the mantle was later adopted by another villain and he was later resurrected. Number 8. Stilt Man. What's better than leaping somewhat high? Walking on stilts, of course. That's the premise behind this strange Marvel supervillain. Wilbur Day is a scientist who began his life of crime after stealing a co-worker's design and using it to build a pair of armored stilt legs. Granted, his entire body is actually covered in metallic armor as well, and it is pretty strong. He even apparently managed to smash She-Hulk down through the street and into a subway tunnel one time during a fight. But being taller than other heroes doesn't mean you're automatically better than them, or that you're going to be helpful in a fight. For one thing, there's that whole knock the legs out from under him strategy, and two, his armor apparently has weak spots which have been exposed in the comics before to easily take him down. Iron Man at one point even fought armor with armor by throwing one of Stiltman's legs right back in his face after he decided to detach them so he could jettison away. And as a result, he knocked Stiltman out cold. Number 7, Fisherman. Any rendition of this supervillain is like a diabolical but less impressive Aquaman. As to be expected as well, he is an Aquaman villain. His Earth 1 rendition was just super into fishing, something Aquaman is not a huge fan of considering global issues of overfishing and given the fact that he is an ocean conservationist, which immediately put him at odds with the fisherman in comics. So what can the fisherman do to beat his nemesis Aquaman? Um, fish? And that's about it. Sure, he has a bunch of fancy lures, but so does my grandfather. And I don't think that's enough to allow him to take on Aquaman. I will say this, the New Earth version of him at least can breathe underwater and attempts to pull off criminal heists using the ocean and the creatures within it, but still, 
That seems to be his main power. And even then, he is still easily thwarted. Obviously, this villain has been deemed so useless that he hasn't even really cropped up in the New 52 or Rebirth. Number 6, Big Wheel. Ultimately, a villain that could be very terrifying if he could actually steer the device that he uses to terrorize people with. The Big Wheel is a Spider Man villain who often gets poked fun at, namely because his device is just so ridiculous. Big Wheel is actually Jackson Wheel, who unfortunately came up with the idea to have a device built by the tinkerer based around his own name. And so he got a giant, uncontrollable wheel. Spider Man dodges him easily in a fight, and Wheel usually meets his demise through being unable to break and falling off the edge of things. Number 5, Crazy Quilt. I have to applaud this DC villain for being a supervillain with a disability, something we don't see as often as not. Still, his being a diverse supervillain was not enough for him to be saved from being turned into a not so strong supervillain by DC writers. Paul Decker was blinded by a gunshot while being captured during a robbery. He was a former painter turned thief. While in prison, he volunteered for an experimental procedure to help him regain his vision. This worked, but only partially. Paul could now see, but he could only see crazy, bright, and blotchy colors, granting him limited and disoriented vision. Seeing the world this way eventually drove him insane, leading him to adopt the supervillain alias Crazy Quilts. He built a patchy, bright costume and a helmet that flashes, blinding lights, among other things. His lack of sanity combined with his lack of powers and lack of true ingenuity when it comes to his gimmick make him an unfortunately easy villain to defeat. Not super useful. Number 4, Sportsmaster. Another villain who seems to be masterful at getting away is Sportsmaster. Not so masterful at fighting though. Not even masterful really at playing sports. Lawrence Kroc is a DC villain who is known for tangling with Green Lantern. He used to be a professional athlete, and although he did have skills, he always took things too far and put winning above everything else. Becoming known for his cheating, he was eventually banned from all sports after severely injuring an opponent on the field. And once his sports career was over, he decided to to turn to a life of crime. So interesting that people like fail in their careers and immediately deflect to this. Like, crime ain't that easy, you know? Finding another job might be your best option, because not everyone can pull this off. Case in point, old Sportsmaster here. Sportsmaster disguises himself and fights with, well, sports equipment. So you can imagine how successful his career must be. One of his signature go to's in a fight is to escape by faking his death. Now, that's no way to win a fight. You'll survive, though. So that's a plus, I guess. Number three, Kite Man. In his original incarnation, this supervillain was pretty useless. Even within his newer incarnation, he's pretty useless. Chuck Brown fights with just what you think he fights with, kites. And just as you'd expect, he is handily defeated every time he pops up in the comics. I feel like a big downfall of some of these gimmicky supervillains is that they get too attached to their gimmick. For some reason, writers keep bringing the DC villain back as well. He often tussles with Batman and was at least given a cooler hang glider to fly around in on, but still Batman manages to out hang glide him. In New 52, he was given a tragic backstory, wherein his son ended up murdered by the Riddler, who poisoned Charles Jr.'s kite string that he held on to? Oh, heartbreaking. What's even more heartbreaking is they gave him this sad story and still no cool way to avenge it. How unfortunate. Number 2, White Rabbit. I'm talking about Jaina Hudson this time. Batman's nemesis from DC. Her powers are neat, but not really useful if you're looking to battle someone. Distract them? Maybe. But that's not really how you win a fight or are useful in a fight. She might be able to survive one though. Her powers give her slightly heightened speed and she is pretty good at escaping. In fact, as soon as a hero shows up, that's her usual go-to move, to just run away. Which gives you an idea as to how powerful she is. She does have a unique ability which allows her to uh, split herself into two people, separating her white rabbit persona and her civilian persona, Jaina Hudson. However, these two personas are quite different, so it isn't even like she can really use her civilian self to like help her take on the good guys. Number 1, Condiment King. The Condiment King originally debuted in the Batman animated series and was created with the intention of being comic relief. So you can imagine, for this reason alone, he's probably not going to be very helpful in a fight. In fact, in the episode he first appeared in, when confronted and chased by Batman, he actually slips on his own ketchup and almost tumbles to his death. You know you're no match for a hero when you are defeated by your own villainous devices. He was later revealed to have been a former comedian who was brainwashed by the Joker, so it's good to know that he isn't an actual villain who takes himself seriously. Still, the brainwashing messed him up and he has since continued to try and take on heroes, jumping from the 
animated series to comics like fellow but ultimately more successful villain Harley Quinn. Number 10, Hugo Strange. This character first debuted in Detective Comics number 36 back in 1940. He's from the Golden Age and is one of Batman's first recurring villains and the first to discover his secret identity, but not in a cool way, at least not at first. In the Golden Age, it was more of an, oh, Bruce Wayne walked by and there was a bat shadow. Ha ha, he's Batman. Hugo Strange started off as a scientist who stole a concentrated light machine to take on Batman. He didn't even become associated with being a doctor medical type until the 70s. Despite his historical significance, he wasn't really much of a threat and his plots were well pretty silly, though that could be par for the course. The Doctor Strange people have come to know and appreciate wasn't introduced till after Crisis, so post Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985. Here he is a psychiatrist trying to capture Batman, but he becomes obsessed. His whole origin was tweaked and made him a much more compelling character, and also eventually increased his intelligence and strategizing levels. He moved up from being a one time threat to someone who worked in the shadows and can mobilize other threats against Batman. Cold, clinical, and insane, Strange began to make the leap into adaptation and has now become a recognized character, from appearing in video games to Gotham to even Batman the Animated Series. Hugo Strange has secured his place amongst Batman's impressive rogues gallery. Number 9, Kite Man. Kite Man comes to us from the Silver Age, debuting in Batman number 133 from 1960. He was a man who decided the best way to commit crimes was with kite themed weapons. For what is more menacing than a kite? This character quickly became a joke and was treated as such, an inconvenience rather than a credible threat. And really, his whole getup was kind of unwieldy. But wait for it, wait longer than Crisis, we need to go all the way to DC Rebirth for this upgrade. Where all of a sudden, Kite Man got a makeover and a tragic backstory. He becomes a linchpin in the backstory of other criminals, for example working to design the Joker mobile. And his villainous career was a result of failed dreams, he ends up getting dragged into events he never anticipated. His affinity for kites is now an homage to his son. It's all sad, it's daring you to laugh at it. Now it's kinda like, oh yeah, you thought it was funny, well look at this. He becomes Kite Man because his son was killed and his son loved kites. This was during the War of Jokes and Riddles, and he takes on the mantle of Kite Man as the ultimate joke before joining the Joker's side and viewpoint. It's an update, that's for sure. Number 8, Dr. Light. Dr. Light has had a rocky journey as a villain. We're talking about Arthur Light here, not Jacob Finlay. Arthur first debuted in Justice League of America number 12 back in 1962, and at first was a villain who fought against the Justice League and the Green Lantern, etc., but then became kind of a joke when he was paired up against the Teen Titans, the first iteration, not the cool 80s new Teen Titans iteration. No, the popular but aggressively hip 60s version. What's the pitch, daddy -o? Yeah, it was kind of hard to have cred when you're fighting teens. However, then something would occur that would ruin Light's character for years. Identity crisis. This 2004 storyline would turn Dr. Light into a rapist. Why? Just cause. He has no motivation. It's literally, oh, I'm on the JLA Watchtower and Sue Dibney is here too, so I'm evil and I guess why not? So after this, he was mind wiped by Zatanna, and this is said to be the reason for his more kiddish switch, and hence why he became a less credible villain. But then he becomes aware of what happened, and well, he becomes a menace once more. But for a while, writers would just make him rapey. He talked about it all the time. The New 52 would change all this, making him a more enhanced meta human who was a threat from the start. I mean, one could argue since he's on Teen Titans go so much, he's still jokey, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. All villains have a function, and if you end up the villain of an A-team, even if they're a bunch of teens, hey, that's not so bad. At least not in my opinion anyway. Number 7, Mr. Mind. Mr. Mind first appeared in Captain Marvel Adventures number 26 back in 1943. He is a two inch telepathic worm who is an evil mastermind. The concept is inherently silly, but one of those ones that does a 180 and becomes awesome. An evil worm. It's too good. He formed the first supervillain comic team, the Monster Society of Evil. Don't let your dreams be dreams. Still, Mr. Mind would vanish for quite a while after the folding of Fawcett Comics. A lot of Billy Batson, at the time Captain Marvel, his characters were considered quite outlandish and were a bit too kiddish. That was some of the mindset. But Mr. Mind would return with a vengeance in the 70s. Now, Mr. Mind was never useless, but he was kind of niche and less well known. The concept of him has become cooler over time. And the thing is, he keeps being shelved. People aren't sure what to do with him. But thanks to Shazam, people are aware of this little critter again and just how powerful he can be. This is Mr. Mind's time to shine, or at least I hope it is. Please give me Mr. Mind as the lead villain in a movie. I want the plushie. 
Think of how cute that would be. Number six, Craven the Hunter. Scandalous, some of you cry. But Craven was not always considered the hardcore cool character he is today. In fact, a lot of that cred can be attributed to Craven's last hunt, where he quite succinctly takes down Spider Man just to prove he can. Craven first appeared in The Amazing Spider Man number 15 back in 1964. He's also the chameleon's half brother. Fun fact. Craven is Sergei Kravenov, and well, here's the thing certain Spidey writers at the time didn't like him. They thought he was silly. It was only during the the last time storyline when Dematisse learned that the character was Russian and made him think that he should have a tragic personality to match. Craven's last hunt was initially conceived with another character in mind, and then it became a Craven story afterwards. This began Craven's ascent to beloved villain, though of course some have been there all along, villain hipsters. Craven is now sought after to be adapted into live action. Whenever people hear there's gonna be a new villain, there's always a group who's like, Craven? What? Where? Number five, Captain Cold. A lot of this is owed to the CW, but not all of it. Captain Cold has long been an antagonist of The Flash, both Barry Allen and Wally West. He first debuted in Showcase number 8 back in 1957. Leonard Snart fell prey to a rep ascribed to The Flash's villains, oft times by people who didn't read The Flash, namely that his villains were silly. And how could Cold be the opposite of Fast? Shouldn't his true antagonist be the Turtle Man? Thank goodness it wasn't. Over time, Captain Cold would come to be the de facto leader of The Flash's rogues gallery, and a quasi frenemy of The Flash and one of the most well-known rogues. Then the Flash CW show happened, and now people have a crush on Captain Cold, a move that cements you in the public consciousness. Just look at Loki. Now he's got his own solo series again and is wearing terrible punny shirts that cause me physical pain. Captain Cold has been credible for a while now, but I still wanted to talk about him. Also because I wanted to tell you about this hilarious classic tale where Barry Allen thought he was Captain Cold. It's great. Am I the Flash or Captain Cold? Number four, Sinestro. This one may be hard for some to believe, since Sinestro is so credible now, and his history is iconic. But there was a time when Sinestro was just kind of meh as a villain, and the Sinestro core was pretty much just Sinestro with a yellow ring that only mattered because it was yellow and lanterns couldn't deal with yellow at the time because reasons. Sinestro suffered a few resets along with Hal Jordan, the Silver Age Green Lantern, because throughout the period leading up to Hal's death, and Sinestro's death actually, the common complaint about Hal and the Green Lantern book in general was that it was boring with a capital B. I disagree, but I read it now. I can't speak to what it was like reading it at the time. The time when you read things adds context to how it is received and thusly how much you enjoy it. It's always important to examine these things. Or you know, don't. Sinestro first debuted in Green Lantern Volume 2 number 7 back in 1961 and was an ally to Hal at first before his true nature was revealed. However, it would be after his death, actually at the hands of Hal, and his resurrection that he would rise more powerful than ever before, with a really lame explanation as to how he was fine, but we're just gonna let that go. Sinestro would become the leader of the Yellow Lantern Corps, or the Fear Corps. His rigid, well-disciplined personality making him a perfect threat to the galaxy and counterpoint to Hal Jordan. Sinestro is up there with the core villains now. It was hard fought. I've always liked Sinestro. I don't think I'm boring. I'm fun. Number three, The Penguin. The Penguin first debuted in Detective Comics number 58 back in 1941. Now, The Penguin started off as just your average villain, distinguished largely by his bird-like appearance and iconic umbrella. At first, an affectation brought on by an overprotective mother. He was a thief who would team up with other rogues often, and he would largely vanish for a time post-crisis. But then, after a tale helmed by Alan Grant, his cred would begin to rise. The aspects of his personality that made him want to be a gentleman and criminal would begin to come to the fore. His desire for sophistication, which so contrasted with his appearance, made him an intriguing combination. And he was one of the villains to get the spotlight on the seminal Batman the Animated Series, which would launch the DCAU, that being the DC Animated Universe. Penguin would eventually become the owner of the Ice Club, and cement himself as a villain who had ties to organized crime and was above petty street level fare. The thing is, he can do both, and he has friends in both worlds. The Penguin is a serious villain. He's always been around, but he's definitely increased his credibility over the years. Number two, Catman. Na 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 Catman. He first debuted in Detective Comics number 311 back in 1963. He was Thomas Reese Blake, a jungle trapper who turned to crime because he was bored and had run out of money because he wasted it. He actually modeled his costume off of Catwoman, and she was annoyed that he was stepping on her turf as a cat-themed villain. Because, yes, he used to go for cat themed items as well. He would later adopt an African styled costume that would always suffer from the fact that he looked like a lame Batman ripoff. But then Gail Simone created the team The Secret Six, and on it was a revamped version of Catman. You know, one of those attempts to make a character hardcore and awesome, only it actually worked. 
largely because it acknowledged his lame past and made fun of it. Now Blake was a grizzled cat lover, yes, but no longer a hunter of them. He was a loner and a reluctant leader. He was also bisexual, which you find out because Gail Simone was tweeting about it, and about how she was going to make it canon next time she wrote the book. Everybody on Twitter has a chance to turn to JK Rowling. Still, I mean, it was pretty obvious that he had a thing for Deadshot. What Secret Six really did for Catman was it made him interesting and detailed him, and I'm a sucker for him in The Huntress. Hero villain things? Sign me up. He's now been permanently upgraded to cool, or so it seems, and he even kept that costume for a bit. Now that's a feat. And number one, The Riddler. Now some of you may be going, hold up, come on, but hear me out. The Riddler first debuted in Detective Comics number 140 back in 1948. His gimmick was that he loved riddles, puzzles, and all that kind of fare. And it would eventually become an obsession that he had to leave riddles, even if they would lead to him being caught. While the Riddler would be a threat that Batman would have to deal with, many times at the start it didn't feel too dire, it was more of a game. And sometimes the riddles, well, they were lame. But over time the Riddler would get a cunning boost and go through phases of being menacing, knowing Batman's secret identity, or planning elaborate chess like crimes where the riddles could be multi-nuanced. He would find legitimacy in games as a mastermind, and an intriguing portrayal on Gotham, arguably one of its highlights. His complexity would be increased, and his desire to be taken seriously as a villain would become a plot point. There's been a big push for him of late at the time of this recording, like in the changed ending of the animated Hush film. Personally, I'm a fan of the reformed Riddler, which is a while back in the past nowadays. Connor wants me to talk about Jim Carrey Riddler, but we're talking about increased menace and cred, not talking about taking him back to camp. Although there are some moments there, hints of darkness that made me wish that had been played that way the entire film. The Riddler's definitely up there with being able to be a threat to Batman on multiple fronts now, and is finally a villain other villains take seriously as well. Number 10, Zeitgeist. Okay, he didn't actually initially start as a villain. Instead, Axel Clunny was actually the leader of the celebrity superhero mutant group known as X-Force. But after his death and revival, he did indeed become a criminal and villain. Now, Zeitgeist has a pretty unfortunate mutant superpower that first manifested in a very unfortunate incident. Basically, Zeitgeist could spew acidic vomit from his mouth, and he wore a protective mouthpiece in and out of his costume. He discovered this power during a little makeout sesh at a beach where he accidentally vomited and melted the girl's face half off. She did survive, but the real kicker is he can't even remember her name. See, he's not really a good guy at all. It was shown that his vomit could burn through 10 centimeter thick steel in less than 30 seconds. Again, not a horrible power, just really, really unfortunate. Number 9, Armless Tiger Man. Gustav Hertz worked in a mechanical laboratory in Munich, Germany during the 1940s. Now one day, his arms were caught in a machine and were amputated. Surviving the experience and given reading material on how to operate day to day using his mouth and feet, Hertz developed skill in using his teeth and his feet in place of his amputated arms. He has sharpened his teeth into fangs to use as weapons and has above average strength, allowing him to bend steel with his mouth. His toes are also very dexterous, allowing him to throw daggers with them, which is actually kind of cool in a little bit of a weird way. He was an enemy of the World War II hero Angel, which is not Warren Worthington. He was also an enemy of Wakanda, and after death, he even came into sort of indirect conflict with Hercules. That's cool. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this video and you haven't already, make sure to press that subscribe button to join us here at Top 10 Nerd. We're almost at 1.30 million subscribers, so definitely get on that. Number eight, The Living Eraser. The Living Eraser is no mere man, you earthbound fools. Sorry, I love that quote from this character, it's kind of hilarious. Kutza here is actually a Thalumian, and he was the agent of the Supremacy. And as an agent, he would use his dimensionalizer to kidnap scientists for nefarious designs. Ooh. The Living Eraser's dimensionalizer can transport people to other dimensions, primarily between Earth and Dimension Z. As the dimensionalizer passes over a surface, it turns it invisible, making it appear as if the victim is being erased. When the entire surface has been transformed, the being or object is transported across dimensions to its destination. If he literally erased people, it would be way more scary, but sending them to another dimension is a fixable thing in comics, so it's not exactly the worst. Number 7, Boomerang, but from Marvel. Fred Myers was born in Australia, but moved to America when he was a small child. Now in America, his great love was baseball, and he developed an extraordinary pitching arm. He became a professional baseball player in the minor leagues after graduating high school, and a few years later entered into 
the major leagues. Within a year though, he was suspended for accepting bribes. Now with an arm like that and no job, he was eventually contracted by the subversive criminal organization, the Secret Empire, and offered employment. They designed special weaponry for him to exploit his pitching ability, and he became their special operative, codenamed Boomerang. Now why Boomerang specifically, and not like... I don't know, a baseball? Because he was born in Australia and that is the only projectile they have in that country, obviously. Number six, Count Vertigo. Now you listen here, okay? Count Werner Vertigo is of royal blood. He is an heir to the throne of Latava, truly the most prestigious of titles, okay? But don't you think for one second that means he has cool superpowers, because he doesn't. Count Vertigo has a hereditary inner ear defect that affected his balance. That's not a superpower. Vertigo had a small electronic device implanted in his right temple, though, that compensated this problem. Tinkering with that device, Vertigo learned he was able to affect other people's balance as well, distorting their perceptions so that they literally could not tell up from down which is an effect known as vertigo. And he used this skill to fight Green Arrow. He'd also use it to join up with the Suicide Squad and Checkmates using his powers to make people dizzy to his advantage. Very nice. Number five, Codpiece. Personally, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when the character of Codpiece was conceived. Codpiece is honestly just a guy with a massive inferiority complex. That's what it says on his wiki though. I'm not, like, I didn't make that up. Okay. Look, in high school, a girl told him he wasn't tall enough, but he thought she meant something else. And so instead of getting like a broken muffler or giant wheels on a giant truck, Codpiece created a suit that had a Codpiece multi-weapon built into the crotch area. The Codpiece had a wide variety of functions, including a cannon, missiles, a sonic attack, two retractable boxing gloves, and a variety of tools such as drills and scissors. If there is one way to compensate, it is by becoming a multi-tool. Look. He's doing the best with what he's got, okay? Number four, Polka Dot Man. While this character got a bit of a change up in the recent Suicide Squad movie, Polka Dot Man, real name Abner Krill, in the comics didn't have a power. He instead wore a suit that was covered in different colored polka dots. When these polka dots were attached to the suit, they had no function, but once they were pulled off, they would enlarge and turn into different gimmicky weapons, like flying buzz saws, blinding sun-shaped dots, dots that turn into fist-shaped projectiles, and even one that turned into a portal. That sounds kind of cool. The dots would even self-destruct to prevent anyone from studying the tech. The only problem was that the polka dot gadgets and the electronic suit were expensive to maintain, and Krill was just literally unable to afford it sometimes. The struggle is real, man. I feel you. Number three, Paste Pot Pete. 1963's Strange Tales number 104 states, Human Torch battles the most fantastic foe of all. Pace Pot Pete and his unbeatable super weapon. Now said unbeatable super weapon just happened to be a glue gun that fired an extremely adhesive multi-polymer liquid that he invented. Pace Pot Pete, otherwise known as Peter Petruski or even Trapster, created a not hot glue gun and his idea was to use this to commit crimes. As you can imagine, the Human Torch really had no problems whatsoever taking down old Pete here and he continued to do so multiple times because Pete does not know when to give up apparently. Number two, Kite Man. Kite man. Hell yeah. Now real me this, nerds. What good are powers like reality warping, energy projection, telekinesis, and super strength against a guy who flies around on a giant kite? Yeah. I'd like to see the Justice League take on Charles Brown and his giant kite. There's no way anyone could possibly stand against that. No sir. Not at all. Kite Man possessed a variety of gimmicked kites, including a jet-powered hang glider that allowed for quick escapes, a mammoth kite that the Kite Man used to shuttle criminals out of Gotham's prison, a flashbulb kite, and a trap net kite. Although, in more recent times, he did temporarily possess the powers of titans. Those abilities pale in comparison to the might of a good kite at your side, though. And in at number one is Ten-Eyed Man. Okay, it's a DC writer's room. You and your buds are sitting around the table. You need a villain, but someone different, someone unique, someone who could pose a threat to the caped crusader, a villain that requires intelligence to beat, some could say. Then all of a sudden, Frank stands up. I've got it! We take away a man's ability to see, and instead, his vision will come from his fingertips, five eyes on each hand. A brief moment of silence follows, as the genius that would become Philip Reardon, the ten-eyed man, has just been created. That is his only power, and as you can imagine, this does pose some problems. For starters, his regular eyes are blind. 
Also, he is often easily defeated simply by injuring his very sensitive eye fingers, which can be done by tricking him into catching or touching something, or even theoretically giving him a high five. But let's not forget it has been shown he can only be kept in a jail cell by keeping his hands locked in a special non see through box because, with eyes on his fingers, quote, escape would be child's play for him. It's true. Coming in at number 10, we have Shocker. I think back when this villain was created, the idea of having someone who had vibrations as their superpower would have been a little bit harder to make fun of. Now, many of you probably know Shocker. He has had a few moments in the sun, popping up in video games, and he even has a moment as one of the henchmen of the Vulture. Now, you think someone who is canon in the MCU wouldn't fit onto this list, but when we break him down, we start to learn that Shocker isn't that shocking. It would seem that this villain has a knack for losing to Spider Man every Every single time, and it's probably because his powers aren't that impressive. He can make shockwaves that blast through the air, and he can make vibration shields. Yeah, I'm not that impressed by what you have to offer. In recent years, we have seen less and less of this punchline of a villain, as I think the writers have seen that his time has come, and he will soon be put to bed. As a kid, I always got him and Electro mixed up because I thought Shocker meant that he was electrocuting people because he was shocking them. Well, at least for the new generation, you won't have those problems because this guy is going to be gone pretty soon. Coming in at number 9, we have White Rabbit. I mean, right when we start breaking down this villain, you will learn why she is on this list. It's one thing to be a down and out loser who's had enough of the cruel world and now wants to dive into a world of crime because everything else has let them down. But when you come from a rich family and you turn to crime just for the sake of being angsty, then I don't really have much compassion for you and your character isn't really relatable. The White Rabbit, also known as Lorena Dodson built her persona off the Alice in Wonderland book. She thought that would be a cool and edgy way to get into the world of crime. I think she just indulged in too many psychedelics and maybe went off the deep end. I wouldn't be surprised if this character was inspired by the rise of LSD in the 80s when this character was birthed. In terms of powers, she has zero. All she has is a bad attitude and a general understanding of martial arts. She's not a villain that any of us are clamoring for. Coming in at number 8, we have Mind Worm. You know, for some of these villains, it seems that the writers went to so much work to really come up with someone who was interesting and had motivations for evil, but then they just throw them in the toilet, and that's what really happens with Mindworm. Mindworm starts off great. He has powers from birth. He's some sort of mutant kid with a huge head. Of course, he's weird and kids don't like him, but at least his parents love his huge cranium. But what Mindworm doesn't know is that he's feeding off the psionic energy of his parents, draining their brain. Eventually, he gets too greedy with this and he kills his own mother and father. He didn't mean to do this. He was just a young mutant kid who didn't know any better and now he was an orphan. From there, he was bullied in the orphanage and he learns how to use his powers. Eventually, he grows up and is living in a New York apartment where he's feeding off all the people in the building and getting pretty strong off this. But Spider-Man moves in and he senses that someone's trying to suck out his brain energy. The two have a clash and Mindworm is killed by some gang members. Like all of that work, into building up who this guy is and he was gone just like that. What a waste. Coming in at number seven, we have Gibbon. We got back-to-back -back orphanage stories for you. In fact, this one sounds like a cross between Mindworm and Robin. Gibbon is basically the missing link. He has all the abilities of a chimp that are amplified way up. He's got super strength, speed, awareness, reflexes. This guy is off the charts when you're talking about his Madden stats. But because of his monkey-like ways, the kids didn't really like him in the orphanage, and he was never adopted. Now, this ended with him growing up and leaving like a regular dude but now he was just a freak with no money, so he decided he could use his mutations to make some cash. And what's the best way for an oddity to make a quick buck? Well, the circus, of course. There you would think he would be among his people, but he was rejected once again, and now he turned to a life of villainy. When we first see Gibbon, he's just a dude that has some monkey skills, but in later renditions of his character, he looks like a full-on ape man. And even though he has the abilities to take down Spidey, the clashes between the two always end up with Gibbon on his butt. Come Coming in at number 6, we have The Answer. Now, this guy is actually pretty cool. He's just used in a very lame way, and his name sucks. The Answer was already a skilled assassin. He was working for the mob boss of all mob bosses, Wilson Fisk. Anyone Fisk wanted taken down, he was all over it. And part of why he was so good at his job was because The Answer, at this time he was known as Aaron Nichols, is extremely intelligent. He showcases genius level problem solving skills, and he can come up with the answer to any problem. 
problem, and this is all before he ever gets any sort of superpowers. There was a time in comics when the Kingpin was just handing out superpowers, but you don't give the first powers to someone you can't trust, so he of course gave his first dose of super juice to his buddy Aaron. But at first glance, nothing happened, which is probably a relief and a bummer. Because if you take some sort of experimental drug to give yourself powers, you want to get the superpowers, but you also don't want to come out a freak. But later, the answer learns that he has one of the most powerful superpowers I have ever heard of. No matter what the situation, when he is faced with a conflict, his body will supply him with the powers to counter who or whatever he's fighting. So normally he's just a guy, but when the time calls for it, he can fly or create force fields or get super strength. But after a run with Spidey that he wins, the character just kind of disappears and we don't see him that much. This guy fits on this list because of the wasted potential. Coming in at number 5 we have Kangaroo. I brought this up in the first video. If you're a villain or a hero and you're choosing your power, you don't have to pick something lame. It seems like some of these villains focus way too much on the branding of their super persona rather than the powers. With Kangaroo, it seemed that the villain was set on theming themselves after Kangaroo ruse rather than having a cool power. He has implants in his legs that allow him to jump very far and he's also a skilled boxer. Like not the worst combination of things, but when you're hell bent on taking out Spidey by stomping on him, you're probably going to lose a lot. There was this weird time in the 70s and 80s where Australia was this thing that the media was trying to push. It was foreign, it was interesting, no one really knew how to sell it. The closest that we got was Crocodile Dundee, but this villain seems like the big wigs at Marvel wanted to make an Australian themed villain because they thought kids would like it, rather than thinking of a good character first. Coming in at number 4 we have The Swarm. Have you guys seen that episode of South Park where they make a joke that the writers from Family Guy are just manatees in a tank and they all pull out 3 random topics to base an episode around? Well that's what The Swarm feels like. They were like, German scientists, killer bees, purple cape. This dude is lame, not only because he's a swarm of bees that is being controlled by a dead scientist consciousness, but also because this dude gets beat by bug repellent. When him and Spidey face off, Spidey's able to beat him by spraying down his suit in bug spray, and then the swarm literally can't get close enough to fight and has to run away. If your weakness can be purchased at Home Depot, then you're a pretty lame villain if you ask me. Coming in at number 3 we have Grizzly. I like how in the Marvel you universe, if you're a bear enthusiast, you'll eventually get superpowers and become one of the lamest villains that Peter Parker has to fight on a semi-regular basis. But if you're a bear enthusiast in real life, you just get eaten by bears. Two very different outcomes. Well, Maxwell Markham was just that, a dude who loves bears, and get this, he was also a wrestler who hurt his fellow wrestlers too much so he got kicked out of the league. We got a dude who loves bears, he used to be a wrestler, what's the third thing that's going to set this guy into the manatee formula? Oh, he was also given a bear suit that would hook him up with some superpowers. Where did he get this suit? Well, he got it from the Jackal, who's one of Spider-Man's best villains, but that dude has a lot of dud moves. I feel like the Jackal just wakes up some days and is like, what if I gave a dude a bear suit so he thought he was a real villain and then Spider-Man would have to deal with it? That would be jokes. Some of his plots sound more like pranks than actual schemes to cause mayhem. Coming in at number 2 we have Hypno Hustler. Next we have a villain that not only has a lame weakness, but their powers were used to such a small scale that doesn't really make any sense why this character was ever made. Hypno Hustler is Anthony Del Soen and he has music that can take over your mind. His songs allow him to control people around him and then they do his bidding. But the thing is, if he hears his own music, he will also become hypnotized. He can't even handle his own groovy music, which seems strange. I've never heard of a hypnotist hypnotizing themselves. But when we first see Hypno Hustler, he's shaking people down for just their pocket change at a show. I feel like this guy should have had bigger dreams. If he got one of his songs on the radio, he could have taken over the world. And coming at the number one spot we have Humbug. Here's the thing, when you hear that there's a hero based off a spider, that's kinda cool because at least spiders are scary, they make web, they do some interesting things. But when you hear there's a villain that just has a general insect theme, you can throw that one in the trash. I really couldn't dislike this villain more. For one, he should be able to beat Spider-Man because he's got a super suit that gives him skills that are on par with the web slinger. But this guy has the worst weakness of all, a love for bugs. He loves bugs so much that Spider-Man has been able to halt this guy from a life of crime by telling him he's going to smash some cockroaches. Like dude, give your head a shake. 
Coming in at number 10, we have Frogman. I mean, if you don't have any powers, you don't have to commit to a super lame animal. Frogman is Eugene Patilio. There was a time when he took his frog suit and he tried to take on some of the hardest hitting street level Marvel heroes. More than once did he come face to face with Spidey and every time he was taken into the dirt almost immediately. And it's not hard to figure out why the guy built a suit where the only power was how high he could jump. Like if you're going to get your powers from some sort of accident or you're born with them, then you don't have a choice. You have to stick with whatever your weird power is. That that's your life, but if you're building a power, then you can be whoever you want. Why would you choose frogs? There are so many other creatures you could go with. Like the falcon. Even though he's not the coolest hero of all time, he's a million times cooler than the dude who hops around and tries to cause some havoc. On the bright side, Eugene's son eventually takes on the mantle of the frog suit and tries to be a hero, but on the downside, Eugene's son sucks at being a hero as much as his dad sucks at being a villain. So in the end, and the family was doomed to be on the sidelines. I would like to see one of those what if comics where Frogman becomes the greatest hero of all time. Hey guys, if you like these videos and you want to see some more, make sure you hit that like button. Number nine, the Trapster. His name is Peter Petruski, and I can't believe how long he's been around. Marvel has him come back again and again, despite the fact that he's got no powers other than this weird paste gun. He invented a super adhesive liquid paste and loves using it for evil. He's redesigned his costume multiple times, always ridiculous and far too proud of himself, but he has definitely been around. He appears in multiple stories and has gone up against the likes of Daredevil, Fantastic Four, and of course Spider-Man. All with just a goo gun. He is hired by Red Skull at one point and even has a run in with Ghost Rider. His paste was once confused for Spider Man's webbing, and Trapster was furious to see Spidey getting credit in the newspaper for his crimes. Trapster is undeniably lame, but he's obviously got some fans because he's been around so long, so we'll leave him here at number 9. Lame, but not the worst. And coming in at number 8, we have Stegron the Dinosaur Man. Once again, if you get to pick your powers, maybe you should shoot a little higher than being a species that already went extinct. They already lost the battle with nature. You think they will be able to take down superheroes? Stegron was originally Dr. Vincent Stegron. He was a scientist who took a liking to the serum which turned Kirk Connors into to the lizard man and he decided he would up the ante a little bit. He mixed the formula with dinosaur DNA and then shot it all up inside his body and turned into a dinosaur human hybrid. He then went on to try and make an army of dinosaurs to try and take over the world but was taken down by a force he didn't expect. It was winter. Dinosaurs are cold blooded apparently so when winter came around they all went to sleep including Stegron. If you're picking your superpower you should go with something that can handle temperatures below 10 degrees celsius. Unless you're in Florida or something. If you're down there, you can build the biggest dinosaur army you want, and the state would probably be fine with it. Number seven, Sly. This guy was a chemical engineer who created a chemical coating that eliminated all friction between that object and surfaces. He's like the opposite of Trapster. He invented the ultimate lubricant. Then this evil tycoon buys up the company that he works for and shuts down the lab. Slide, aka Jalome Beecher, was going to build his own company founded on the nonstick solution he invented, but no bank was willing to give him a loan. So he did what anybody would do and decides to rob the bank. He makes himself a costume out of this material and free from the clutches of friction, is able to zip around skating on the ground up to 30 miles per hour and can't be stopped, not by people's grabbing hands or even Spider-Man's sticky webbing. Now, this isn't exactly the most lame villain, but the idea of this slippery criminal sliding all over the place just doesn't really do it for me. Where's the stakes? Spidey could just wait for this guy to slip and fall off of a cliff or into oncoming traffic, or they could just have him slip and slide right into a jail cell. I'll say one thing, the way that he zips all over the place in the comic panels looks like a lot of fun. Number 6, The Walrus. With big wet flippers and menacing tusks and the blood curdling cries of ARF ARF, it's easy to see how terrifying a walrus based supervillain could be. This guy is not. Hubert Carpenter was created when his uncle, a janitor, tried again and again to give Hubert powers. They exhausted the names of animals he could have the proportionate strength of all the way through the alphabet till they got to the letter W. He was totally stumped and then became inspired by a poster of the Beatles and becomes the walrus. He goes on a classic spree of mass destruction. 
eventually seeing Beast lecturing at a university and decides to attack him to prove that he's the greatest product of modern science. Hilariously enough, it's actually Frogman who gets the credit for taking him down later, and this really gets the blubber boiling. <laughs> Spider-Man can't help laughing when he meets this guy and winds up taking him down for the second time with just a tap of his finger. Coming in number five, we have typeface. You know what everyone loves? Signage. So why don't you make your persona based off that? I'm sure that will pull in a ton of people and you'll become one of the most famous super villains of all time. No way man, signage is super lame. Well, typeface, also known as Gordon Thomas, didn't think so. And he had a pretty good foundation. He was a Vietnam War vet who was skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, military tactics, and all sorts of weapons. He even beat Spider-Man in their first encounter. If this guy changed his theme to anything other than signage, he probably would have been pretty cool. But the reason that he did this was because when Thomas came back from war, his life fell apart and he ended up getting a job at a sign shop and it was the only time in his life where he ever felt happy. When the place was bought out, he lost his job and this was his inspiration to become a villain. Luckily, he eventually switched sides and becomes a hero. If you're gonna get an F on your character, you might as well be on the side of good. Number four, the spot. This guy is something else. Some people think his powers are pretty cool and others hate him, but he definitely belongs on this list. Spider-Man himself bursts into tears laughing upon meeting this guy and <laughs> looking like a Dalmatian, it's pretty easy to see why. He's all white, covered in black spots that function as two-way portals. That's pretty much his main thing. He takes the spots and he chucks them around and uses them like portals like this is Looney Tunes messing around with Spider-Man and even making him punch himself in the face. If this guy doesn't sound lame enough already, the more portals that he throws around, the less spots that he has on his body, making himself more vulnerable. He got these powers after being exposed to the spotted dimension, and the spots can even be suspended in mid-air. It's honestly a pretty cool concept, but the villain himself is just too lame to make it work for me. And coming in number three, we have Spider Side. Like genocide, but performed by a spider. Yeah, that is not the best writing I've ever heard of in my life. Spider Side was birthed out of the Clone Saga, which is considered one of the worst sagas in comic history. So any villain to come out of it is probably never gonna see the light of day again, unless they're used as a joke. Spider Side is a clone of Spider-Man that has the ability to regenerate from what seems to be any accident. He was convinced at first that he was the real Peter Parker, but then he found out that he was just a freak. Such is the plight of most clones. When you read his character on paper, it sounds super cool. He has the powers of Spider-Man with some of the most deadly features of the Terminator, but the character was used in such a horrible fashion that it became a laughing stock before it ever got its time to shine. Maybe in the future, we'll see someone use this character to its full ability. Number two, Plant Man. In Strange Tales number 113 from 1963, we meet the mysterious Plant Man. This gardener turned professional criminal was born in London and orphaned at a young age. When he left the orphanage, he became lab assistant to a well-known botanist who was studying the low-level mental activity of plant life. Unfortunately, this guy fired him for focusing too much on this invention he was making and not gardening for him. One day, lightning strikes his plant ray gun that he's been working on, and it becomes imbued with the power to control and animate plant life. Ooh. So he then makes a disguise and sets out to get his revenge for being fired by framing his boss for robbery. The plant life isn't the only thing with low-level mental activity, as this guy made from leaves somehow thinks that he can take on the Human Torch. He is later quickly defeated and his ray gun is destroyed, uh, although I'm sad to say he does appear again in 2002. And coming at the number one spot, we have Big Wheel. This villain's theme is a massive wheel that he rides around and it has guns on it. Reading some of these is like watching a breakdown of a group of YouTubers trying to find out what they need to do so they can set their channel apart from everyone else. Like maybe if I was the wheel guy, then people would like my content. Well, Big Wheel's just an ordinary guy until the tinker gave him something that was probably a prank, a massive wheel that could ride around and had guns on it. You think something like that would be extremely hard to control and you would be right. Big Wheel would die when he lost control of his massive wheel car thing and fell into a river and drowned. Here's a lesson for any future villain. If you want to pick a gimmick that is going to set you apart from the rest, before you make a hard decision and invest in a giant wheel that will get you killed, 
and make you look like a fool, you should probably hire a think tank to come up with a better idea. Like I said earlier on in this list, you can pick whatever power you want when you're building it from scratch. So why go with wheels? 